Get him up here. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Hope everybody's doing okay. I hope life is treating you well. So, are you ready for another lesson this week? This will be uh, week four. So, that means the next week we will have a midterm. All right. We'll have a midterm. So, this is scheduled for as I look at my calendar here. Um, this is scheduled for the 31st of January, okay, this lesson itself. And then we'll have uh, our midterm at the uh, end of the first week of February, okay? All right, so let me get into this international relations theory. I'm only going to touch on theories that, and you'll see it in the reading, uh, directly came out of international uh, relations. There's other ones, but they're not as important. I have to give you the central important themes, okay? All right, let me go through the procedure here. Go to the material. And, um, from the beginning. Oh, I gotta get myself out first. We don't need extensive viewings of the teacher, all right? We already know what he looks like, it's dangerous. Okay, there we be, so that's a nice pretty screen. Let me hit the next one. Introduction to international relations, or as you will see in the material, I am now referring to this as IR, so do not get confused when I just say, what about IR, or what about this theory of IR, okay? Again, I'm telling you that uh, this is for the 31st and just on the bottom, I'll let you know here it's for week four. Okay. All right. You ready to start? Okay. I hope so. Otherwise, I can say like I used to say in class, oh, well, let me go to the restroom and I'll be back in 30 minutes and, you know, people are going to go crazy. So that's my joke for today. All right. So here we go. International relations theory. Theories of international relations allow us to understand and to try to make sense of the world around us through various lenses. Now they're talking about like camera lenses, right? We need a lens to focus on things and get a clear picture of things. Uh, each of which represents a different theoretical perspective. So remember there's different kinds of perspectives people have on things. Okay. Some people look at things as you'll see as a very realistic, and that's the way of life. And some people look at them in a different way, like, no, everything should be love and flowers and sheep and candies, you know? So people can look at things differently. In order to consider the field as a whole, which means the complete field for beginners, and that's what we are, including myself. I'm not an international relations uh, person involved in the government. And this is on a three-part spectrum. I'm sorry, for beginners necessary to simplify IR theory. And like, that's what I said in the intro. I want to simplify it for you. You may get the main gist of it, right? If you want to pursue it later, learn about it and learn about other different issues, that's on you, right? My job is to make you strong in the basics. Okay. Uh, this chapter does so, does this by situating IR theory on a three part spectrum of traditional theories, the initial ones, middle ground theories, and critical theories. Examples are used throughout to help bring meaning and perspective to these positions. Readers are also encouraged to consult the book's companion text, International Relations Theory, published in 2017, which expands greatly on the subject matter of this chapter. So that's, that's always the way it is. An intro class gives you the basics, lets you understand what's going on, gives you the structure, and the next level will 
give you all the advanced or changes or other types that are not involved just in the um, basics. So uh, I have a question there. So let's go to it. Go to the trusty whiteboard. Whiteboard's getting stubborn. Let me get that pencil. There we go. Question one. Oops, jumping ahead of myself here. Here we go with the IR. Now you know I can make that a onesie. Uh, what do IR theories allow us to understand? Okay. And as I've stated before, within the questions, I try to put a word, maybe understand, hint, hint, that allows you to easily locate uh, the answer, okay? So go ahead, go at it. Okay, doing okay there with my hints and then not a lot of reading material. You should be able to get this pretty quickly. You guys think you're doing okay there? All right. Uh, let me go get the eraser. Repeating, what do IR theories allow us to understand? Pretty self-explanatory. Back to the material. We stopped here, uh, which allows us to greatly end the subject of this chapter. Okay. Before we get started, uh, one very important note here. You may notice that some of the theories you are introduced to here are referred to by names that also occur in other disciplines or studies. Sometimes this can be confusing, as for example, realism in IR is not the same as realism in art. So don't be confused about the two. Similarly, you may hear the word liberal being used to describe someone's personal views. You know, people, I'm a liberal. I voted for Biden, you know, and uh, college kids should not have to pay for their student loans. Everything should be free, right? Um, that's what you hear a lot of liberals saying. And those are their personal views. But in IR, liberalism means something quite distinct or different. And I will do my best to try to explain what that means, okay? And to avoid any confusion, this note will serve as a caveat. Caveat is a Latin word, um, not easy to explain. 
uh, a lot of American people, even though it's used in our slang, don't really understand it. Um, it just kind of means that, uh, you know, oh, it's hard to say, but um, it just means like, don't worry, we're not going to, you know, tell you all the other minor uh, ways or new ways that have come into different little theories. I'm only going to cover the uh, basics, so don't worry about that, okay? So again, as it says here in this chapter, we only refer to the theories concerned as they have been developed within the discipline of international relations. And that's what will hopefully keep it uh, easy for you to understand. I mean, I could sit here and just to, you know, chew up space, um, tell you a lot of different theories, uh, get you panicky about the test because you don't know which ones I'm going to ask about, or am I going to ask about, let's say, if I taught you like 10, and I'm going to ask one question from each one, it's like, Jesus, no, you should just know the structure and the standard smaller set to make it easier for you to remember this information, which is great. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit more here. Uh, start a little bit with traditional theories. Uh, theories are constantly emerging, which means coming forth, showing up. And then they compete with one another. They always compete one against the other. For that reason, it can be disorientating. Disorientation means you get confused, right? You get confused. Uh, so it can be confusing to learn about theoretical approaches. Again, that's why I'm going to keep it to a minimum. As soon as you think you have found your feet, which means you understand with one approach, you realize there are many others. Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, printed in 1962. Yes, as far back as that. Was anybody around in 62? Anybody? And this set the stage or prepared everybody for understanding how and why certain theories are legitimized and widely accepted. So what that means is not all of them are accepted widely or legitimized. Give in vote of confidence given the acceptance into society. Uh, like, for example, I'll, I'll tell you something strange. It's not international relations, but I, I don't know if you know, if you've heard about people that still think the earth is flat. Okay, this was something that was thought of hundreds of years ago before Europeans went out and uh, sailed the seas and did their best to map the world they thought the world was flat and for many years people did not try to go far on ships because they said the world is flat and you'll eventually come to the end and your ship will go over like on a fall right well as they uh, the word is circumnavigate the globe circum it means go around the world in a circle uh they found out that it wasn't true there was no point where ships went over the end and everybody died but we still have people with a theory today that think the earth is flat somehow, right? But it's not widely legitimized or widely accepted. You know, you don't see it in the books that they say, yeah, flat earth theory, you know? It's still just different groups of people that have their beliefs. So that's one belief that's not uh, widely accepted or legitimized, okay? Uh, so Kuhn also, he also identified the process that takes place when theories are no longer relevant and new theories emerge. So what happens with that is things can change over time and then new theories can take their place. Like um, as we've learned a little bit here, uh, before the invention of social media and computers and internet, we, people were stuck with certain types of uh, information delivery and really waiting 
considerably long periods of time. So within that area, uh, you know, whatever theories they had at that time, that's the way they were. But you change things and have where people can send an email. I can send an email to somebody in China and they can get it within minutes. Uh, that makes new situations, right? Which will have new theories and ways of understanding stuff. So that's why it's there as, uh, you know, a process that takes place where some theories are no longer relevant and new ones, you know, come about. All right, so from there, I have another question. Again, trying to keep these questions simple and straightforward to you so you get a so solid basic knowledge. There's an easy one, this is good for you. Okay, and I think I can also stretch this one into a one. One more little, push it, push it, mamas. There you go, okay. This chapter will only refer to which theories, right? So if I have my funny guys there, you know, Mr. Hong and whomever, of oh, the crazy theories, the theories about Halloween? Uh, no, I've said it a number of times here, so this should be easy. This chapter will only refer to which theories that we will study, okay? So go ahead. Okay, I think you guys are doing okay. Not listening to uh, <laughs> my usual funny guys. I hope not. Okay, should I go for the famous uh, eraser? Okay. Where is that thing? Okay, again, repeating. This chapter will only refer to, refer to rich theories, which will make your test, midterm test easier, okay. which again is next week. Just a reminder. Okay, so we finished down here in the part of traditional theories. New theories emerge. Let me make sure that I'm following correctly with my notes. 
Don't want to get us lost. All right, let us move. All right, for example, see, here we go. Repeating what I said. Human beings were once convinced that the earth was flat and accepted this as fact. Yes. With the advancement of science and technology, uh, again, uh, satellites that can photo the, the earth all the way around, and we know that it is a circle, a sphere. Humans discarded or threw away this previously accepted belief. When such discovery takes place, a paradigm shift results and the former way of thinking is replaced with a new one. That's kind of complicated, a paradigm shift. Don't worry about that. It won't be on the test. Um, I know a lot of American people that don't understand that either. Uh, but a paradigm shift means, uh, I'll break it down to you as simple as I can, right? Because it's, it's good for you to know. I'm sure if you can use this in your English, people are going to say, wow, I think Mr. Hong is from LA. He's not from Korea. So um, a par paradigm shift means your whole accepted way of thinking, okay? All of it, right? So when you get a new discovery, it, it's just thrown away because I mean, it has to be unless you don't accept uh, reality, right? And then you replace it with a new one, okay? Um, if you're still a little confused there, um, I'll, I'll tell you something, something I heard in the news that I hadn't heard for a long time and I'd forgotten about it. It was pretty revolutionary. I think it, oh, I think they did this initially when I was maybe in my 20s, so uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> Okay, um, for a long time, doctors uh, to replace people's organs. And remember the number one, the number one reason why uh, organ transplant surgeries don't work is because your own body rejects it as being foreign, right? So that's why even, you know, amongst uh, humans, anybody, they try to, the doctors try to find an organ that is as close of a match to you um, as acceptable because it can still be rejected, but there's a higher chance that the body will accept it. So that's why a lot of times, let's say, someone needs a kidney transplant, they really recommend someone like your brother or sister to do it, right? Because they share the same blood, maybe the same blood type. So there's a higher chance that if you get a kidney from your brother or your sister that you will survive, the body won't reject it. So anyway, a previous paradigm, right? Complete way of thinking was that it would always be impossible if you couldn't find a match for a human that maybe an animal's uh, organ could be replaced. People say, oh, hell no, that's ridiculous. We can't, no. So that way of thinking was uh, proven incorrect many years ago when they gave a man a pig heart. And um, believe it or not, I know you're going to be, sh you know, that's, that's shocking as it is, but uh, somehow biologically, we share a lot of similar things with pigs. Why that is, I don't know, but they took a chance on that and the man's body did not reject it. And uh, he lived for a number of years. So it gave him some life. So once that was done and the man's body didn't reject it, and, you know, you got one, two, three, four, and the years went by, we knew that that was possible. Then the old paradigm, the old way of thinking took a shift and we threw it away and said, yes, we can use uh, pig organs to help people extend their lives. Okay. 
So that's the best way I can explain it. So, um, although changes in IR theory are not as dramatic as the example above, there have been significant evolutions um, in the discipline. This is important to keep in mind when we consider how theories of IR play a role in explaining the world and how based on different time periods, that's also very important, what could have happened years ago may not be able to happen now and vice versa. And um, again, this is important to keep in mind when we consider how theories of IR play a role in explaining the world and how based on different time periods, and our personal context, one approach may speak to us more than another. So listen, that one may speak to us again, personal uh, beliefs and feelings come into play here. Traditionally, there have been two central theories of IR, liberalism and realism. Although they have come under great challenge from other theories, they remain central or as we say, uh, just like language changes, we, we kind of don't say central anymore. We say the core, right? The core to the discipline. All right. And I have a question there. Question three. Okay, I'm gonna to try to make this a onesie. Wish me luck. Yay, because IR is only two letters. Okay, name the two traditional central theories of IR. I think I just went over this. It should be easy. So again, I don't wanna hear my funny guys. Oh, the skinny and the fat theory. The thin crust pizza and the thick crust pizza, no. So go ahead, answer that. You guys doing okay there?
Okay. Razor time. Repeating, name the two traditional theories of IR. Not the fast and slow theories. Right. Back to the material. We stopped here, remain central to the discipline. Let me move on. Okay. At its height, which means at its most popular, um, liberalism and IR was referred to as utopian. Um, I don't know if you've heard that term before, utopia. Uh, utopian comes from the word utopia, which means a perfect, happy, uh, society, like I said, candies and sheep and small children and beautiful butterflies. And a lot of people think, oh, we can accomplish a beautiful utopia. A lot of times, unfortunately, these people do not have any way about accomplishing that. It's only a dream, but you can't build a society on just a dream without knowing where you're going or what kind of structure you're going to give it. So, uh, liberalism was referred to as utopian theory and is still recognized as such to some degree today. Its proponents or believers view human beings as innately good, which means they feel that once you are born, um, you are good. There's no bad children. There's no people who are born bad. Uh, everybody has to be taught how to be bad. But I don't think these people have seen small children, like people who work with them and just see some kids do bad things without having to be taught, but they don't believe that, okay? And they believe peace and harmony between nations is not only achievable, but desirable. I, I think this English here in the book should have been opposite. It should have been, it's not only desirable, what you want, that goes first, what you want. The achievable part, the second part is something that there's no guarantee, right? It's just like, a, let's say a young married couple, they obviously love each other, but uh, there is no guarantee that in 10 years, they will still love each other, right? Unfortunately, uh, life is sad like that, unpredictable. You just never know, okay? Uh, Immanuel Kant developed the idea in the late 18th century that states, again, from the first chapter, we structured everything on states being the core, that shared liberal values should no, for no reason, uh, should have no reason for going to war against one another. So what they're saying there is, if you believe in peace, love, harmony, sheep, candies, butterflies, then... There's, there's never should be a reason for having a war anywhere in the world, you know? but unfortunately, people sometimes do irrational or foolish things. You know? In Kant's eyes, the more liberal states that were in the world, the more peaceful it would become. Since liberal states are ruled by their citizens and citizens are rarely disposed or thinking about uh, wanting or desiring war. This is in contrast to the rule of kings and other non-elected rulers who frequently have selfish desires out of step with citizens. His idea, meaning the king, have resonated and continue to be, or I'm sorry, can't, and continue to be developed by modern liberals, mostly notably in the democratic peace theory, which posits that democracies do not go to war with each other for the very reasons Kant outlined. Okay. All right. And believe it or not, I have a question in there too. Okay.
Oh, sorry about that. So you see, I just gave you a little, I talked about this. So this should make this answer very easy. So describe utopian theory. And again, the more you write down, the more points you can get, especially if I ask this on the midterm. So go ahead. It's going to take a little longer because you have to write up your sentences, not just one word answer. I'll give you more time. So you guys doing okay? And I'll, I'll give you a little more time. Like I said, you got to write, you know, at least probably three sentences there describing. It's not a one word answer. Okay, think you guys are doing okay on that? All right. Let me mark down first that I've asked you questions three and four, trying to keep track on my uh, notes here. Okay, let me get the eraser. All right, again, describe utopian theory. And, uh, this might hint, hint, come up on the midterm and you would have to write at least a few sentences about it, okay? So I gave you a good little spiel on it a few minutes ago. So that was the point of that. It wasn't to uh, expose my feelings, but to just help you with the study, okay? All right. All right, for the very reasons can't outline, that's where we ended off. Here we go. Further, liberals have faith in the idea that the permanent secession, that means the end or termination of war is an attainable goal. Okay, that's what they feel. It is an attainable goal. 
taking liberal ideas into practice, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. You're going to say, who the hell was Woodrow Wilson? They're going to tell you the time frame right now, okay? Addressed his famous 14 points to the U.S. Congress in January 1918. Was I around in 1918? No. My father wasn't around either. Um, during the final year of the First World War, as he presented his ideas for a rebuilt world beyond war. The last of his points was to create a general association of nations, which became the League of Nations, and later this turned into the um, United Nations. Uh, dating back to 1920, the League of Nations was created largely for the purpose of overseeing affairs between states and implementing, or basically using, as well as maintaining international peace. However, when the League collapsed, right, the League of Nations fell apart, disbanded due to the outbreak of the Second World War, 1939, its failure became difficult for liberals to comprehend or understand as events seemed to contradict their theories. Therefore, despite the efforts of prominent liberal scholars and politicians such as Kant and Wilson, liberalism failed to retain a strong hold and a new theory emerged or came forth continuing the presence of war. That theory became known as realism. So what we're gonna learn here is that, uh, you know, being a realistic person, uh, and you know, you've lived a little while and you know kind of how life works. And as the books have said, bad things can happen to good people, right? Um, you have a more realistic look at life compared to a utopian look or outlook that states everybody can be happy at the same time, and, you know, and uh, realists look at it a different way and say that it's just not possible, right? Uh, I, can I give an example to help that? Um, Sure, I, I can give a lot of examples, right? Um, let's say, for instance, um, there's a popular restaurant, right? And let's say you yourself have gone there. And uh, you love everything about the restaurant. You think the food is fantastic. You think it's cool looking. The service is very good. In fact, you know a couple of waiters or waitresses there. And everything's cool. And you have a lot of people that you know that also love this restaurant. And let's say, for argument's sake, they really don't do anything bad. Okay. Um, but if you look where people can post Instagram or what have you and say if they like the restaurant or not, there's always going to be some people that say they don't like it. Right? I mean, you, it, it's just the way of the world, right? If you're a real, if that's how you think as a realist, right? And a lot of the critiques or when people don't like something, they're the silliest critiques, you know? Again, you're thinking, hey, the food was great. The prices were good. The waiters and waitresses were friendly. There was a nice atmosphere. This place is fantastic. And then you find out, like you'll read a complaint and the person says, I was not happy at the restaurant because I didn't like the color of the curtains there. I don't think they matched the paint on the wall. And since they didn't match, it made it hard for me to enjoy my dinner and if 
I'm not enjoying my dinner, then I have a bad experience. So I don't recommend this this restaurant to people, okay? And that's just the way life is, unfortunately, okay? All right, so are you ready to continue as we get into more of the realism? I'm just prepping you for that, okay? Here we go. So we've gone to the next page. Okay. Realism gained momentum during the Second World War when it appeared to offer a convincing account for how and why the worst conflict in known history originated after a period of supposed peace and optimism. And unfortunately, that's the way it's gone in all over the world. You have, let's say, long periods of time where there's peace and optimism and People are happy, and uh, then suddenly there's war. Like, what the hell is going on, right? And unfortunately, these are the cycles that have happened um, everywhere through the, throughout the world. Uh, although it originated in name from the 20th century, many realists have traced its origins in earlier writings. Indeed, realists have looked back as uh, far back as to the ancient world where they detected similar patterns of human behavior. Again, see, that's the thing. Humans are unpredictable. I mean, even you and me, we're, we're just unpredictable. And uh, human behavior um, as those evident in our modern world, and that still continues to this day. As its name suggests, advocates or supporters of realism purport or put forth the idea, it reflects the reality of the world and more effectively accounts for change in international politics. Uh, Thomas Hobbes is often mentioned in discussions of realism due to his description of the brutality of life during the English Civil War of 1642 to 1651. Hobbes described human beings as living in an orderless state of nature. That he perceived as a war. Um, of all against all. Okay, let me make sure I didn't skip here. Perceived as a war of all against all, okay? To remedy this or to fix this, he proposed that a social contract was required between a ruler and the people of a state to maintain relative order. Today, we take such ideas for granted as it is usually clear who rules our states. Each leader or sovereign, a monarch or a parliament, for example, sets the rules and establishes a system of punishments for those who break them. We accept this in our own respective states that our lives can function with a sense of security and order. It may not be ideal, but it is better than a state of nature. As no such contract exists internationally, and there is no sovereign in charge of the world, meaning one world government, uh, disorder and fear rules international relations. That is why war seems more common than peace to realists. Indeed, they see war as inevitable, right? Inevitable means a, is, a, is a word that means something that cannot be changed, right? It is inevitable for us as human beings that if you live, if you don't get killed, you will get older. Uh, you, and then unfortunately you will age, you know, lose your hair, get wrinkles, get fat, lose mobility, what have you. It's just inevitable, you can't stop it. And that's a realistic way of looking at it. When they examine history, they see a world that may change in some shape, 
but is always characterized by a system of what they call international anarchy as the world has no sovereign to give it order. Again, there's no one world government that says, hey, everyone's gonna do what I say. So many different countries have their own problems within themselves, right? Hong Kong's having a problem with the mainland China. Hong Kong used to be its own country for many years. Uh, and, uh, you know, Israel and Palestine. So that's the international uh, anarchy. Right. Let's continue. One central area that sets realism and liberalism apart or makes them separate is that how they view human nature. Again, this is important. It was touched back in the beginning where it said uh, liberalists think there's no bad babies. Everybody's born innocent and pure. And it's only after they're taught to do something badly that they become bad. Uh, realists do not typically believe that human beings are inherently, and that's what inherent means, born good, or have the potential for good as liberals do. Instead, they claim individuals act in their own self-interests, right? Again, so if I can support that, like my baby uh, example before, how many times have you seen, let's say you have a brother and sister babies, right? And the one baby just goes over there and takes the other baby's uh, donut, right? And just takes it. Okay, that's bad. That's not good. And let's say they were not taught that by the parents. The father doesn't go and, you know, forcibly steal the mother's donut. So the kid just did it on themselves because they're kids and they're growing up and they don't know a lot, right? They act in their own self-interest. Hungry, want, delicious, right? So that's what they're trying to say here. And people continue to do so as they get older in various forms. So for realists, people are selfish and people can be selfish and behave according to their own needs without necessarily taking into account the needs of others. Realists believe conflict is unavoidable and perpetual and so war is common and inherent to humankind. Hans Morgenthau, a prominent realist, is known for his famous statement, all politics is a struggle for power. Morgenthau said this in 1948. This demonstrates the typical realist view that politics is primarily about domination as opposed to cooperation between states. Here it is useful to briefly recall the idea of theories being lenses. Again, we talk about camera lenses. Realists and liberals look at the very same world, right? But there's one world and they look at the very same world. But when viewing what through the realist lens, the world appears to be one of domination. The realist lens magnifies instances of war and conflict and then uses those to paint a certain picture of the world. Liberals, when looking at the same world, adjust their lenses to blur out areas of domination, so kind of like erase them, and instead bring areas of cooperation into focus. Okay. Before I continue reading, I have a question there. It's been a little bit since a question, right? Sometimes read a lot, a few questions, sometimes read a little, throw a question in there, mix it up. Keep you on your toes. Okay, I should be able to make this a toozy to make it look good. Okay, what is the one central area, one central area that sets realism and liberalism apart, keeps them separate? Tell me what that is.
You know, I might have skipped a question there for you. Let me see, I'll have to check on it. But answer this first and I'll fix it. Don't worry. Sometimes I get too excited, wanting to give you as much information as I can. So again, I'm only asking for one here, this one. Okay, you think you got a hold on that? And I'll start checking. I think I skipped the question. It's a pretty basic and easy question. So let me get this out of the way. Uh, what is the one central area that sets realism and liberalism apart? All right, now let me go back here. Okay. Went into focus. Okay. I do not think. I asked, if I did, I'm just giving you the question again, so don't worry if you've done it. All right, but I wanna shoot it in there. It's basic, because I want, I mean, we have to explain one side and we have to do the other. I just don't wanna give you information, uh, let's say on uh, liberalism, and then you don't know about the realism. So, this would be question six. So if I gave it to you, then ignore it. Take a sip of your soda. If I haven't, then this is good. This will probably, I'm doing this because it'll probably show up on the midterm. So I gotta make sure it's better me not to forget and don't give it to you than give it to you twice, right? Yeah, I can make this a onesie. What do advocates of realism purport? Which means think, okay? So just tell me how they think, right? So go ahead and hit that.
Okay, and again, the more you write on this, the more points you get. If you give me a basic couple of word answer, the person who writes two sentences is going to get more points because you do have to explain it, describe it. Okay, think you got a hold on that? All right, let me get the eraser. Repeating, what do advocates or supporters of realism purport or think? Back to the material. And again, we're into focus. Then they can paint a slightly different picture of the world. Now let me match up my paperwork. Here we go. It is important to understand that there is no single liberal or realist theories. There's different ones. Uh, scholars in two groups rarely fully agree with each other, even those who share the same approach. Uh, each scholar has a particular interpretation of the world, which includes ideas of peace, war, and the role of the state in relation to individuals. And both realism and liberalism have been updated to more modern versions, which are neoliberalism and neorealism, that represent a shift in the emphasis from their traditional roots, so kind of shifting into different areas. Nevertheless, these perspectives can still be grouped into theory, families, or traditions in your studies. You will need to unpack or just say learn the various differences. But for now, understanding the core assumptions of each approach is the best way to get your bearings or the uh, best way to understand something. Okay. All right, continuing. For example, if we think of the simple contrast of optimism and pessimism, we can see a familiar relationship in all branches of liberalism and liberal uh, realism. Um, so that goes back to something that I was taught as a kid, right? When we talk about uh, pessimism is you have a negative outlook on life and optimism is you have a positive outlook on life. So the traditional psychological test was they'll show you uh, a glass. Okay, and I have to watch my wording here, let's say, okay. Let's say the glass is only full to the middle area, right? And the person, they say, well, how, how do you see this glass? And the person says, well, it's only half full, right? Then, um, they say, well, they're pessimistic, right? They think negatively. And if a person responds, oh, well, it's, you know, half empty, then they say, well, that's, uh, you know, actually it's the reverse. If it's half full, then you're, you're, you're very optimistic. If you say it's half empty, then you're very negative. So these things are similar to what we're learning here, okay? All right. Okay, all right, so it says here, liberals share an optimistic view of IR, believing that the world order can be improved with peace and progress, gradually replacing war. They may not agree on the details, but this optimistic view generally unites them, brings them together. Conversely, on the other hand, Realists tend to dismiss optimism as a form of misplaced idealism, and instead they arrive at a more pessimistic view. This is due to their focus on the centrality of the state and its need for security and survival in an anarcho system, which means a crazy chaos system, where it can only be truly rely on itself. 
As a result, realists reach an array of accounts that describe IR as a system where war and conflict is common and periods of peace are merely times when states are preparing, wow, listen to that, for future conflict. Okay, so I have a question in there. This would be question seven. Does that got the pencil in there? Okay. This is easy and straightforward. Okay, let me make this a two. You give the names of the updated names, right? Give the new names, in other words, of realism and liberalism, okay? All right. Okay, that shouldn't take long. That should be pretty easy. Okay. All right. Give the names of the updated names. So give the new names of realism and uh, liberalism. Okay, so we left off here with preparing for future conflict. Let us proceed. Okay, another point to keep in mind uh, is that each of the overachieving, overachieving, uh, overarching approaches in IR possess a different perspective on the nature of the state. Both liberalism and realism consider the state to be the dominant actor in IR, although liberalism does add a role for non-state actors such as international organizations. Nevertheless, uh, within both theories, states themselves are uh, truly regarded as possessing ultimate power, okay? This includes the capacity to enforce um, I just lost my, my position here, what's going on? Okay, this includes the capacity to enforce decisions such as declaring war on another nation or conversely treaties that may bind states to certain agreements. In terms of liberalism, its proponents argue that organizations are valuable in assisting states in formulating decisions and helping to formalize cooperation that leads to peaceful outcomes. Realists, on the other hand, believe states partake in international organizations only when it is in their self-interest to do so. Many scholars have begun to reject these traditional theories over the past several decades because of their obsession with the state and the status quo. Brings us to the finish of that page, and I do have a question there too. Question eight, so we're getting close to the end here. Yay.
me stretch this. Okay. Who do realists and liberals consider to be the most powerful? So don't get confused here. I'm not talking about a person. I'm talking about an entity, right? An entity. That's the best way I can say it without giving you the answer. So it's not a person. It's an entity. So who do they think has the most power? So go ahead. Okay, so if I got my funny guys there, well, I think they consider Joe Biden to be the most powerful. Or maybe it's Putin. Come on, that's a person. I'm talking about an entity here. Okay, let's go for the eraser. It's pretty straightforward. Where's my arrow? All right. Material, oops, previous. Okay, so we did here status quo. Now let's turn it over. Let me match my paperwork. I've asked you questions seven and eight. Getting close here. Okay, now we're into the middle ground. The thinking of the English school is often viewed as a middle ground between liberal and realist theories. Its theory involves the idea of a society of states existing at the international level. Hedley Bull, one of the core figures of the English school, agreed with the traditional theories that the international system was anarchic, which again, chaotic. However, he insisted that this does not imply there are no norms, expected behaviors, thus claiming there is a social societal aspect to international politics. In this sense, states form an anarchical society where a type of order does exist based on shared norms and behaviors. Due to its central premise, the English school is often characterized as having an international society approach to IR. This describes a world that is not quite realist and not quite liberal, but rather a world that has elements of both. And I have question nine there, so you know we're getting closer. Let me fix this up a little bit. How is the English school viewed or looked at by other people? And what does its theory involve? Okay. I think I should put a what in here if I can get in there. There we go. Okay. And again, should be a twosie, okay. What does its theory involve? So go ahead, explain that. I just talked about that. Let me mark off that this is question nine.
I can't. Just let you know that's a two-parter. Okay. That's a two-parter. How is it viewed and what is its theory? Don't forget that. This is good practice for your midterm. Okay. And make sure you write that. It's going to take a little bit longer. Okay, you guys doing okay there? I can proceed. We're getting close. You know. All right. Eraser. Uh, how is the English school viewed or looked at, and how do, what does its theory involve? Okay. We ended here elements of both. Now let's get into constructivism. Constructivism is another theory commonly viewed as a middle ground, but this time between mainstream theories and the critical theories that we will explore later. It has also some familiar links with the English school, so kind of similar. Unlike scholars from other perspectives, construction, uh, constructivists highlight the importance of values and shared interests between individuals who interact on the global stage. Alexander Wendt, a prominent constructivist described the relationship between agents, individuals, and structures, such as the states, as one in which structures not only con constrain agents, but also, which means hold them back, but also construct their identities and interests. His famous phrase, anarchy, is what states make of it. Again, anarchy, chaos. When said this in 92, uh, sums this up well. Another way to explain this and to explain the core or central idea, like I said, central has been replaced by core now, of constructivism is that the essence of international relations exists in the interactions between people, okay? Um, and after all, states do not interact. Uh, of constructivism is that the essence of international relations exists in the interactions between people. After all, states do not interact. It is the agents of those states, the actors, such as politicians and diplomats who interact. As those interacting on the world stage have accepted international anarchy as the defining principle that's become part of our reality for everyone. However, if anarchy is what we make of it, then different states can perceive or think about anarchy differently and the qualities of anarchy can even change over time. International anarchy could be replaced with a different system if a critical mass of other individuals, meaning a large population, and by proxy, the states they represent accepted the idea. To understand constructivism is to understand that ideas or norms as they are often called have power. IR is then a never ending journey of change, chronicling the accumulation, of the accepted norms of the past and the emerging norms of the future. As such, constructivists seek to study this process. All right, so it's time for the last question. I'm sure we're happy about that. Question 10.
and I can make this a onesie pretty easy. All right, what is highlighted in constructivism? Again, I'm using highlighted because it will help you find the answer. Okay, so go ahead. That is question 10. So again, just give me a couple of points. What is the main theme? What is the core? That's all I'm looking for. You don't have to go into great detail. Now, I know this is the last question. Let me get the eraser. What is highlighted in constructivism? I have a little bit more to read to you. There's no more questions, and it's only a very little amount to read. I have to read it to conclude. Okay. All right. And here it is. Right here. This is it. Okay. This chapter has surveyed or studied the main approaches in IR theory, each of which possess or has a legitimate yet different view of the world. Both views are legitimate. It is important to note that the theories um, listed in this chapter are not exhaustive, which means not complete. And there are many more that could be examined. However, this is a good starting point for achieving an overall understanding of the field and where the most common approaches are situated. Hopefully this has helped you consider your own theoretical inclination or where, where you think, what you're thinking, how you're thinking, or at least piqued your interest, which means made your interest stronger in determining where you might stand. It is not necessary to adopt one theory as your own, but it is important to understand the various theories as tools of analysis that you can apply in your studies. Using a theory to critique an issue, as this chapter did with the United Nations, is to understand the reason why these theories exist. Simply, they offer a means by which to attempt to understand a complex world. As international relations has grown in complexity, the family of theories that IR offers has grown in number. Due to its complexity and diversity, it is common for newcomers to have some difficulty in grasping or understanding IR theory, but this chapter should give you the confidence to get started okay so go back to the stop share there i am how are you doing we're done for this week and uh, get ready for next week will be um your midterm okay so everybody take care bye, -bye.